Welcome to Summit's Online Encounter. Our mission is to provide locations where people like you can have life-changing experiences with God. This is one of those locations. We also gather each week as a church in the heart of St. Paul. As disciples of Christ, we are doing our best to be on mission, deliver hope, and champion this city. At any point in your journey, if you want to take the next steps, or you just want to stay in the loop with everything going on at Summit, just grab your phone and simply text the phrase, Be Known, to 651-360-2908. We'll send you a short form. Please complete it so that you can be known in our Summit family. One of the ways to grow your faith is through worship. Worship with our lives in serving and worshiping Jesus with a song. We have pre-recorded some music in our sanctuary to create a place for you to worship with us virtually. So focus in, give way to the space needed, and invest some time in worshiping Jesus.
was a sacrifice Use me how you are to God Have your throne within my heart I hear you I hear you One of the rhythms that's important to following Jesus is studying Scripture. As we study the Bible, we can have hope, find guidance, be corrected, and receive truth into our lives. Let's open God's Word and hear this week's message. All right, as we get dive into the message today, I am I'm definitely, we are continuing that purple rain. Pastor Eric designed these uh, little on-the-nose shirts for sure. Uh, I like them. Anyway. Uh, as we get into this message, I'm, I'm curious, how many of you are like avid moviegoers? Like you love, you love a good movie. Four people. Because on Prime, not, you're not going to the theater because it just costs $75 to take two people to the theater <laughs> nowadays. Yeah, I, I mean, how many of you are like, if you want me to watch a movie, I'm just going to take a nap? Anybody? All right. Yep. That describes my household right down the middle. We've got like half... That could watch a movie and then the other half could just out right away, not even, not even a choice. Have you noticed, though, that some of our movies that we really enjoy over the, at least over my lifetime, have been the ones that have this fascination with trying to destroy that which is indestructible? You know what I'm talking about? Like, there's movies out there that the whole point is trying to destroy the thing that you think you can never destroy, and then they end up destroying it. Like... Okay, I'll give you some examples because there's a lot of, like, looks on what, what are you talking about. How, like Terminator. Anybody, I, but don't watch it if you haven't. But Terminator, <laughs> oh, claps for Terminator, great. <laughs> Man, uh, Terminator is, like, the reason we're all scared of AI, right? So there's, there's a whole, like, a whole genre around trying to destroy the robot or the AI that's trying to kill us. Right, and then if it's, if it's not Terminator or through AI, what else we got? We got a bunch of other ones. Uh, zombies. Right? There's a whole list of movies and TV shows that are all about trying to destroy the zombies. And what was the one with Will Smith? Like, I Am Legend or something like that? That's the one that took it all to the next level because all of a sudden the zombies could sprint. Before that, zombies were slow and nobody was really, nobody was really scared of them. But after that one... Man, y'all, they would come after him. <laughs> it's like, that was crazy. But he was able to, I don't know if he destroyed it or not. Uh, if that's not it, and then we got aliens and UFOs. We got all of this alien stuff. War of the World started it all. Independence Day kind of made a parody of it. Uh, alien, Predator, like all of these movies about trying to destroy aliens or UFOs. And if that's not, not enough, we have all the magic things. Uh, can somebody explain to me why, if I mention Harry Potter in church, Everybody freaks out, but if I mention the Lord of the Rings, everybody's like, oh, yeah, that's all right, we can do that. It's all, of us, it's all about trying to destroy magic and these magic things. And Narnia's even got an element of that, although I'm not picking on Narnia. Narnia's amazing. I'm not, don't email pastor at Summit Church, yeah, man, that's Eric's email. How about meteorites, like there's Armageddon, you remember that, like the meteorites are going to come destroy the world and they're indestructible. I think you get my point. Super villain, villains, every Avengers movie ever made, X-Men, all that stuff, trying to kick, kick out the super villains that, the villains that are indestructible. And then just for a twist, it's just the super hu humans. Like Avengers, you don't know if they're good or bad. You just know that they're not able to destroy them. And what is like the whole sum of all of it? If you're going to destroy the indestructible, what do you need? Everybody get your Tim Allen impression out. You guys know who Tim Allen is from Home Improvement back in the 90s? If you are looking at me with a blank stare, I'm sorry. But, like, that was my life growing up was watching. Uh, and what did 
he always say? What, what was it all about? If you wanted to, def- if you need what? You need more power. But you got to do it like Tim, more power. You got to get a good male grunt in there. And women, you can do it better than most of us men can. So, like, more power. Yes, right? Okay. More power. That's what we need if we're going to try to destroy the indestructible. So here's my question. What has more power that has been attempted to be destroyed more than anything else on the planet? That's a real thing. What has more power than everything that's tried to come after it and has still survived today? Well, welcome to week four of Purple Rain and the series that we've been in over the last four weeks. This is the fourth week of Purple Rain. The first couple weeks, uh, Pastor Eric talked about uh, how the, the church is, is what? The church is purple. The, the politics that of the day try to get us to align to one side or another. There's the red, there's the blue. There's in, what color is independent? Gray? We'll just call them gray. I have no idea. I know independent is like supposed to, I just thought that meant you didn't have a party, but no, you're actually, there's an independent party, whatever. There was only one that was even close, right? Ross Perot way back in the day. Anybody else from the independent party even been close? I don't, I don't, I'm not even sure. Anyway, it doesn't matter because the church isn't those colors. The church is what? The church is purple. Right? And, and Pastor Eric boldly went down a list of all of the different political uh, things that each party would try to claim as uh, moral superiority. And, and then there's others that would try to claim that either of those moral superiorities are aligned with biblical truth. And what he said was that we can't align with the blue or the, or the red, but instead we need to be purple. We need to follow Jesus because the truth is neither side is sufficiently Christian. Neither party, none of the parties, none of the leaders of the parties, there may be a few exceptions along the way, but for the vast majority of them, none of them are sufficiently Christian in their thought process. None of them are actually allowing the Christ uh, that we believe in, the one that we place our hope in, to drive their decision making. There's too much other stuff that gets in the way of that decision. So we don't put our hope in a political system. We put our hope in the Lamb. We put our hope in the one who gave his life for us, Jesus. And the royalty color was what? Purple. It just so happens red and blue make what? Purple. So the church is purple. Now that doesn't excuse us. That doesn't excuse us from participating in the politics of the day. Right? That's part of our life as a church. Like we, we are people that live in the communities that we live in. Therefore, well, politics are part of it. Like, we're, we're supposed to engage with our dominion, the dominion God has given us, to, well, to exercise our rights to vote. Like, I'm not telling, I'm never going to tell anybody not to vote. I'm going to say, no, use your convictions that God has given you and vote out of your convictions. That's what we did the first two weeks leading up to the, se- leading up to the election. And then last week, well, we talked about the church being positioned, positioned to practice. And there's a, a verse in, in 1 John that I think is, uh, is really good about this because, uh, again, we're not Democrat, we're not, in, we're not independent, and we're not Republican, but we are the church. We are specifically designed for a reason, and because there's people in the church, the church is political. So we use our voice, but we don't bow down to the politics of the day. We don't, we don't bow, bow down to what some have called the temple of their democracy when they mention the U.S. Capitol building. Like if that doesn't tell you what's happening uh, from a uh, trying to religious, uh, trying to religionize, that's probably not a word. It is today. <laughs> trying to religionize politics, I don't know what is. Like there's this idea that somehow your political affiliation is your religious conviction, and I would say your religious conviction ought to lead your convictions in whatever decisions you make. Let us be a place that is sufficiently Christian, and where do we practice that? Here. The church is specifically positioned to practice what? Well, it says in 1 John. Dear friends, let us love one another because love is from God and everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. The one who does not love does not know God because God is love. God's love was revealed among us in this way. This is where it's really important to see the definition of love. God sent his only son his one and only son, into the world so that we might live through him. The definition of love is found in Jesus. Love consists in this. Not that we love God, 
but that he loved us and sent his son to be an atoning sacrifice for our sin. Dear friends, if God loved us in this way, we must also love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God remains in us and his love made us complete. In other words, the church is positioned to be different because of the way that we practice one anothering one another. We talked about that last week. And if you missed it, you can head over to the podcast. You can go to the YouTube channel and you can catch up. I, I would go to the podcast because I think half of the video <laughs> didn't load up, but at least all the audio is on the podcast. So just go there. Plus, who wants to watch me stand here on a stage anyway on YouTube? That sounds horrible. Uh, podcast on the car while you're driving, always the way to go. But something like 27 times, Bill, correct me if I'm wrong, isn't one another that, 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 uh, that ele- eleion, uh, it's or all alone if you want to mispronounce it. But, but that's the Greek word for one another. Is, 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 it sounds like all alone. Aleon. 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 That's it. Wow. Sorry. But there's like 27 instances in, throughout Scripture, throughout the New Testament, that describe what, how to one another one another and how not to one another one another. We talked about all that uh, last week. And the truth is, we can't do that on our own. The hard part about the message last week was there were there are people that are in such dis, like disrepair and distraught over the uh, election results, and there are others that want to shout it from the rooftops that they're so excited and they can't wait for what's going to happen next. And the reality is, it's really hard for those two camps to one another one another. And I think we are lying to ourselves if we say that that's easy. There was nothing that I said last week that made life easy for us. It's just what we're called to do. It's to one another, one another. And there's a whole list that we could go down. We already did go down it. But in order to live that out, we need something. What do we need? We need one another. That's great, Swan. Amen. You cannot one another, one another if you're all alone. That's a true statement. And what else do we need? to get over ourselves to be able to actually do it. We need more power. I need to do Tim Allen better. I should have practiced that. Uh, I think I had Popeye the Sailor Man down the other day pretty good, but Tim Allen not so much. But we need more power. This is, this is how I know this, 1 John four thirteen. This is how we know that we remain in him and he in us. He has given us his spirit. So in order for us to love one another the way that John re- lines out, we need his spirit in us. Because his spirit does what? His spirit gives us more power. Acts 1.8, but you will receive power, dunamis, dynamite, dynamic, that's the word. Power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and all Samaria, and all the way to the ends of the earth. The church is purple. And that purple church is filled with people, and people living in a culture are political. Therefore, the church is what? Political. But the church is also filled with spirit-empowered people. People who are filled by the spirit, so therefore that makes the church what? The church is empowered. So in this final week of this Purple Rain series, I want us to grasp this. If I was to define what I'm hoping you catch is that we don't need to be afraid of what's going to happen to the church. We also don't need to overstate what's going to happen to the church, positive or negatively. The church has more power than the culture it finds itself into because the Spirit of God rests on His church in His people. And I want us to walk out of here knowing that as a truth today. To have the hope when we leave these walls and go outside these windows, we carry with us the power that the Spirit has given us to be a church that is all about one anothering one another. So let me dive in. This power that we live out is a different kind of power. Jesus' kingdom is a different kind of kingdom. When you think about the first century and where Jesus found himself, it was all about this hierarchical structure, and the power structure was just that. Like the power structure dictated who was in charge of what. Family lineage had to play with that, but also just your sheer force. 
the ability for you to inflict pain on somebody else or inflict your will, impose your will on somebody else was classified as power. And listen, from the time of Pharaoh, that's the Egyptian leader back when Moses was there. From the time of Pharaoh, he led with a rod and he led with the power that that staff carried and his ability to wield it. Politically, yes, but also physically through his army. Pharaoh had power because that's the way the world designs power. The worldly power is all about my ability to overpower you or manipulate you to do whatever I want you to do. That's worldly power. And there were times in Jesus' ministry where he had, this is a different sermon if we go down this road too far, but there, there's a times in Jesus' ministry with his disciples that he had to remind them, this is not the power that we're going to wield, guys. You're not going to lord over one another this positional thing. It's not who we are. It's not the movement that we're doing. Another time in the garden, he's like, am I leading a rebellion? Put your sword away. No, like that's, the earthly power is not the power of Jesus. It's a different kind of king with a different kind of kingdom. The purple reign of Jesus is a part of a different kingdom, and it brings a different power structure. It brings a power structure that's more about laying one's life down for somebody else than it is about manipulating or dictating how somebody else should live. That's a wild difference, yes? What happens, though, when we live out that is oftentimes we feel like we're just going to end up being a doormat for somebody. There was a time when I was a police officer, and when I was a, a sergeant, I had already met Jesus at that point. And everything about my life changed. But before, I wanted to be a leader in law enforcement because I wanted to be a leader. I wanted to have my way. I wanted things to go the direction I wanted them to go. I wanted the guys to follow the orders that I wanted to give them. And then I met Jesus, and he wrecked my world. And all of a sudden, everything I thought I wanted with the guys, I didn't care about anymore. And instead, all I wanted to do was serve with open hands. And just be there for him. And next thing I know, I got promoted like this. So I ended up being a police sergeant. And I had to remind the guys because, and and the women that I got to oversee, because too often they would look at the kindness and grace and mercy as a weakness. Right? They would think that they could just do whatever they wanted to do because I was kind or I was merciful or I was compassionate towards them. And I had to remind them time and time again that that doesn't equate weakness. Don't don't mistake my kindness for weakness. Don't mistake my ability to uh, to advocate for you as a weakness of character. Don't don't mistake my ability to uh, to be available to you as meaning you get to walk all over me. I'm not a doormat. God's not calling us to be doormats. Eric, Pastor Eric says it perfectly. He's calling us to be doorways. To be that space in between where people can be walked through from this power structure into the new power structure that is Jesus. Because they see our example of it. Right? That is the power of this new king. That is the power that Christ has set us up to be. And some of you might feel like this whole Purple Rain series all by itself is is really telling you to be a doormat. And I'm saying, again, don't be a doormat. Be a doorway. Be a way forward for somebody in their life, a way for them to recognize there's a different way to live. There's a different kind of power that they can have that isn't about making somebody else submit to them. It's not about forcing your way on somebody. It's, it's having the power of the Holy Spirit in us. It's knowing Jesus as Lord. It's knowing that God's power rests on us by because we're known by God. The church is empowered. But the church has been in trouble since its beginning. But here's how the church has been empowered. 1 Timothy 3, 14 to 16. Uh, This is Paul, by the way, writing to Timothy. He says, I write these things to you, hoping to come to you soon. But if I should be delayed, I have written you so that you will know how how people ought to conduct themselves in God's household, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and foundation of truth. That's so key. We are, we are God's household. When we say yes to Jesus, it's not a building. It is a bunch of people filled by the Spirit that make up God's house. That's who we are. The pillar of our foundation is the truth of the living God. 
he didn't stay in the grave, he came out. Most certainly the mystery of godliness is great. This is where it explains how Jesus established the church. He manifested in the flesh, that's Christ in the flesh, vindicated in the spirit, seen by angels, preached among nations, believed on them in the world, and taken up into glory. And after he was taken up into glory, what? He sent the Holy Spirit. That song we sang, King of Kings, there's a line in there that I love. It's, it's towards the end. It's the spirit lit the flame. And that flame is the movement of the church. Like the Holy Spirit lit the flame that is the church that still exists to this day. So how do I know? How do I know that the church is actually empowered? How can I be sure that the church is empowered? Because the church has overcome every political system ever invented. Think about that for a minute. For 2,000 years, the church has faced opposition, internally and externally. And here we are, talking about Jesus in a building of followers of Jesus 2,000 years later. God's church is not susceptible to government. God's church isn't susceptible to people. Not those that want to destroy it. It has existed through all of it for over 2,000 years. Don't believe me that it started under persecution? Acts 8, 1 to 2. Saul agreed with putting him to death. This is, this is uh, uh, Luke talking about the first martyr, the first person that was killed for their faith, at least the first recorded known uh, person who died because of their faith and their faith alone. And this guy named Saul agreed with putting Stephen to death. On that day, a severe persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem. And all except the apostles were scattered throughout the land of Judea and Samaria. Devout men buried Stephen and mourned deeply over him. Spoiler alert, Saul is this one that's eventually going to be known as Paul. He was in agreement, completely in agreement with them stoning Stephen. Solely based on his faith. Not because of anything else. He didn't harm anybody. He didn't cause an uprising. Only because of what he believed. He was like all for him being put to death. And then what happened? A severe persecution broke out. I love that there's an interesting word, uh, diogmos is the Greek word for persecution. And I don't know why I keep using the Greek. None of you read the, do you really care about the Greek? Some of you might, I don't know. Uh, but the word diogmos, and we could go down like the root of it and all that, but he, the root of it is this idea of pursuit. Right, diogmos at the base of it is a pursuing characteristic so persecution means the original church was chased. So you want to know why they scattered all over the place? Because they were literally being pursued. To the level of this, look, Acts 8.3. Saul, however, was ravaging the church. Like That's a pretty intense word, ravaging the church. He would enter house after house, drag off men and women, and put them in prison. Saul... Spoiler alert, also known as Paul, also known as the guy who wrote a third of the New Testament. Remind me again why your past does not allow you to serve God's kingdom. Remind me again how your past somehow has more power than the Holy Spirit to overdo and, and forgive you and move you in to doing the work God has called you to do. Remind me again, how, how's that? I mean, if this guy can go from pursuing door to door, kicking down doors, grabbing men and women and throwing them in prison and write a third of the New Testament? You think that stolen car has prevented you from serving God's kingdom? You think that extramarital affair has somehow made it so that you can never serve God's kingdom? No, man, repentance is offered, forgiveness is offered, and you are able to step into a new life because Christ empowers you with a new life. I mean, if Paul can do it, I think you can too. The church is empowered. It started with Saul, this being chased after. It went through the Pharisees, the religious elites. It moved through the believing world, and it was rejected by the believing world until this guy named Constantine shows up. This is like, I don't know, like 300, maybe AD, something like that. This guy, Emperor uh, 3 something. There's a, what? I was close. See, I said 300. I was, I was there. 313 A.D. When Emperor, Emperor Constantine comes on the stage. 
This is a guy whose mother was a Christian. And I would say this is the first attempt at an individual trying to politicize the church. Because what he did was he put this symbol on a shield called the Cairo. It's the first two letters of Christos, the Jesus uh, in, in the scripture for the Christ in the scripture. It look, if you haven't seen it, I should have put an image up. But have you seen the one where it looks like a big P and an X, right, all together in one image? That's the Cairo. He put this on the shields of his soldiers so that when he sent them into battle, they believed that the power of God was going with them in the battle, and it put fear in the ones that they were fighting, and he ended up overcoming. And he ended up becoming the emperor uh, because of his might. He didn't use the kingdom power. He used the earthly power, and he tried to manipulate God's power over the people. God just so happened to choose his reign. But there's a, here's the crazy thing about Constantine. Uh, I, there are most scholars, many scholars would question his Christianity. He put it on there for his own benefit, and his mom was a follower of Jesus. But the reality is he stayed a, a pagan priest until his deathbed. He deferred his baptism all the way to the, his death. I don't even know if he got baptized. But deferred it at least until the day that he died. He was the first attempt at politicizing the church, here's the thing, that is not the last time that that would happen. That has happened time and time again. We could fast forward uh, to the Crusades. Uh, you, you could fast forward to Germany in 1930s when the first thing they tried to do was take over the national German church and dictate what they could preach and what they couldn't preach. There's actually a movie coming out by a guy named Dietrich Bonhoeffer. I think it's coming out next weekend uh, in the theaters that kind of outlines. He was this... He was this pastor, this Lutheran pastor who stood against this politicization of the, of the church in Germany, and he got hung for it. He also was part of the coup to try to assassinate Hitler, so do what you will if you want about that theology. But, but that, that's Dietrich Bonhoeffer, and if you haven't studied the life of Bonhoeffer, man, it's probably, probably worth it. So that's the government side, but the persecution didn't stop either. The Islamic movement of the 700s tried to eradicate, completely eradicate, the, the followers of Jesus. That's why the Crusades were a response. Time and time, here's what I want you to understand, church. Time and time again, from within or from outside, the church has had to withstand a barrage of every kind of possible attack on the church to try to destroy it or diminish it. And here we are, 2,000 years later, talking about Jesus. Because, yes, you can clap for that. Because the church is empowered. We still see persecution today. I don't know if you know this or not, but if you go to our missions page uh, through our church center app, in order to see that page, you've got to be either A, a church member or partner, or you need to be a regular attender. And if you want to see that page and you're not able to have access to it, just email me, chad, at summitchurchmn.org, and I'll make sure that you can see it uh, as long as you're a part of the church. Why do we have that restriction on there? Because there are people serving in countries all around the world that are still considered sensitive countries if too much information about them is like we can't even put their last names uh, especially because of the technology today if somebody in that country were to find out that they're serving as a missionary in that country they would be kicked out of the country or worse just talked to a friend of mine who was just over in turkey that uh, he was meeting with the wife of a pastor who has been in prison for 18 months because he's the pastor he didn't do anything else all he did was had a, a group of people in his home that he would talk about Jesus with. And the government came in and locked him up for the last 18 months. There's nothing new. The way that we have, we have, whether we have a political system try to politicize the church, or we have uh, outward oppression and outward anger and outward uh, uh, persecution over the church, all of it existed before and it still exists today. We can have confidence that the church will prevail. Why? Because the church is empowered. It's empowered because we are spirit-filled followers of Jesus, willing to do the work. And I'm telling you, that power, I'm convinced that there is nothing that can overcome it. Uh, Romans 8, 35. I almost said glasses. Shush. Who can separate us from the love of Christ? Can affliction or distress or persecution 
or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, because of you we are being put to death all day long. We are counted as sheep to be slaughtered. So is persecution going to overcome the church? I love the response. No. In all these things we are what? We are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels, nor rulers, nor present things, nor things to come, nor powers, nor heights, nor depths, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So when we gather together, church, we are the church. And if we can't be separated from the love of God, then the church can never be destroyed. That doesn't give us permission to sit on our hands. It gives us confidence to get to work. Because otherwise we sit around going, woe is me and how am I going to, and man, I don't even know if I can. No, this should give us conviction and power to go, yes, no, I can step in to my business. I can step into my school. I can step into my home and my family. I can step into my community and I can be a clear follower of Jesus. And I don't have to apologize for loving Jesus. Who knows what's going to happen to you, but that doesn't matter. Because you are empowered believers. If you know and love Jesus. If you've surrendered. Listen, if you're not a Christian yet, don't go do that yet. First, surrender your life to Jesus. You have that opportunity every single time. Every day, any moment of the day. It doesn't have to be in a Sunday. You could go home tonight, crying into your pillow, and just say, Lord, I surrender my life to you. Make me brand new. I repent of my sin. I am sorry for all of the ways that I have corrupted my life, corrupted your word, and I just ask for your forgiveness. The scripture tells us you'll be forgiven. You don't have to clean up your life before you come to Jesus. You just have to give up your life for Jesus. You can do that because you will be a spirit-empowered church. So how do we become more than conquerors? Well, first, we got to surrender our life to Jesus. And if you haven't, man, do it tonight. Find me after service. I don't care. Let, let's, let's work it out so you can walk in a new relationship with Jesus to live the spirit-empowered life. That's what we're all about as a church is to help people be empowered by Christ. To live as citizens, not of this world, even though we are, but to live as citizens of heaven. I love Philippians 1, 27 to 29. Just one thing. As citizens of heaven, live your life worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then whether I come to see you or am absent, I will hear about you, that you are standing firm in one spirit, in one accord, contending for the faith together to the gospel, not being frightened in any way by your opponents. This is 1 Philippians, by the way, 1 Philippians 27 29. I know I don't have a slide. This is a sign of destruction for them, but for your salvation, and this is from God. For it has been granted to you on Christ's behalf, not only to believe in him, but to suffer with him. If we are followers of Jesus, if we are spirit-empowered followers, we need to lay down our right to be offended. And pick up the power to offer ourselves as a living sacrifice to Christ. Holy and pleasing to God, not willing to be conformed by the image of the world, but to be conformed in the image of your king, my king, King Jesus. That's Romans 12, 1 to 2, my paraphrase. Why? So we can be transformed by the renewal of our minds to know what God is, uh, what is good, and how to operate in the will of the king. That's what Jesus established us to do, is to operate in his will, under his power and his authority, not our own. That's a different kind of kingdom, y'all. That's a completely, totally different kind of kingdom than what the world wants to pander to us. And I'm not some kind of cultural savant. I don't know all the ins and outs of the culture. All I'm saying is I know that God's asking us to live differently. And he's empowered us to do it. And that is why we gather together here. To practice one another in one another in this faith. To live out of the power that we've been given by the Holy Spirit to actually do the things that he's called us to do. To love for one another, pray for one another, carry the burdens of one another, to not judge one another, but actually, like I said, bear that burden of somebody else. For, for us to 
confess our sins to each other. To, so Why? So that other people know they're not alone. And then to pray over them with it, to, to let them know that they've been released, to encourage them, to serve alongside them, to, to be about the kingdom work here and now. We are all about living empowered in here so we can live empowered everywhere. Or practice living one another, one another and one another in here, it's even hard for me to say, so that we can live empowered everywhere. That's what, I'm, that's what my challenge to us, church, is how can we practice in here so we can live empowered everywhere? That's what we're called to do. That's who we are, a church that is filled by truth, moved by love, engaged with power to help one more person be known, find hope, and love the city. Some of you are doing that really, really well. Others of us, we have, we have work to do. And we're just asking that those of you that get it and have figured out a way to do it, will you help us? Will you grab a hold of us and encourage us and instruct us and show us ways that we can join you in this mission to help one more person be known, find hope, and love the city? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for uh, your word. Thank you for your church, that you have empowered your church through your Holy Spirit, that we don't have to be afraid of what comes next, because we know the church will prevail. It might not be easy, it might be like the pastor in Turkey that's in prison because of it, but we know that you still have work for him to do in the prison. God, what's that look like for us? For the world outside of our window, what does it look like for us to serve your kingdom here and now? God, will you reveal it to all of us? And then bring it into unity, into harmony, so that we can live in harmony with one another in here. So that when we go out there, we can live those empowered lives, making a difference in somebody else's life. God, encourage us and show us and challenge us and convict us in the right ways, so that when we leave here, we realize that we truly are on mission for you, empowered by you and your Holy Spirit. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Hey, thank you all for being here today. Next week is I Heart St. Paul Sunday. Come on back, fill a bag up, have a big old potato. We're going to talk about what it means to love the city. Love you guys. See you next week. To help you apply the truth found in Scripture, we always like to ask three questions. What did you learn about God? What did you learn about yourself? And how are you going to apply what the Holy Spirit is speaking through Scripture to your life? We hope that these questions help bring clarity for you. Thank you for being a part of our online encounter. Join us in person sometime as we gather as a church on Summit Avenue. Or join us here virtually again next week. Let me just say, our city of St. Paul is absolutely amazing. I encourage you to check out all the history it has to offer. And you need to know Summit Church, this church has been a part of that history with so many amazing churches in our city. But speaking specifically about the people of Summit, well, we've been gathering here since 1932. And my hope is that this would be a rich history. It would be our forward legacy. History is a thing of the past, but legacy, it makes way you know, for the future. So the question I have for us is where are we going? Uh, that is a good question. Our vision is simple. It's really to see all of people and beyond living as disciples of Christ, people full of hope, uh, fully known, actively loving one another, living a spirit-led life. Our mission, it's also simple as well, to provide rhythm, location, opportunity for you to have a life-changing experience with God. Uh, you know, we all journey in our diversity to do these three things, become disciples of Jesus, deliver hope, and to champion our city. That's where we're going and that's what we're doing. So maybe a question for you is where are you going? You know, what are your next steps? I would encourage you to do this. Join one of our monthly expeditions. The expedition is a simple experience where you can find out more about who you are in Christ, who Summit Church is, what we do around here, and how you can maybe even, you know, play a part. It's less than two hours of your time uh, for the whole month. We also feed you amazing food and even provide childcare. So the question is, where are you going? Hopefully to the expedition is my thought. We're all on a journey following Jesus, maybe together. We just might not be us without you. We'll see you at the summit.